However, it's different. You know, we had a, a Beijing Olympic in 208. Yet today, uh, counting the number of China multinationals, uh, there's really not many uh, going global. So China's going global is really in a different uh, 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 modes and different models. Uh, as I can uh, see that uh, really China is, is uh, adopting an approach that's very differently from the uh, uh, multinational uh, traditional approach. So what are those approaches? I'd like to uh, analyze that and share with you. So uh, basically, uh, based on the Chinese unique situation, you know, it's, it's opened up, uh, not very, very long ago, and also uh, state sector, private sector, and China adopted a very a different a global strategy and, and has the models and modes differently than the traditional multinationals. So for this thing, I'd like to summarize some of the Chinese uh, going global models for, for, for the question for the research. Uh, and, and this is also uh, probably we have to rewrite the uh, multinational uh, literature in terms of uh, investing globally. Uh, so that's really uh, interesting to look at. Now, I would like to uh, first summarize the Chinese Bay Global as a higher model. You know, basically, it's the uh, uh, setting up workshop based overseas. I know as we all know, higher is a big uh, uh, electric uh, manufacturer in China, but it's also very active overseas. Higher set of offices in USA, uh, Italy, uh, Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Pakistan, uh, Jordan, and, uh, and other, many other African countries. So basically, their approach is to set up manufacturing shops overseas. And this is not many companies in China adopted that, but Higher has done that. And Higher now is the top world top uh, uh, in terms of refrigerant producer, uh, actually top of the, the world pool as the uh, biggest. Uh, refrigerators in the world. So their strategy is basically to set up shop overseas. And now the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the second model is, is a nanoble model. I, I call it buying a ship and sail to the sea, which is the Chinese say, jie uh, uh, Well, nanoble has, as we know, both PC uh, division in 205 and has actually used its product lines to expand into the global market. But this model of buying well known multinational division and uh, leaves a number of new ships to sell to the sea, and a number actually, uh, after they acquired IBM division for the PC computers, they ranked the third largest uh, PC leaders in the world, and that's really a shortcut uh, for the Chinese company to go. And this is actually, uh, since then, uh, and now it's become an international global brand. Now, the third model is basically the TCL model, and uh, uh, it's a JV approach, joint venture approach. And uh, as we all know, TCL and Thompson of uh, France has created a joint venture, and then also the uh, uh, team now is Agatha uh, announced a mobile joint venture. So TCL approach is, is somewhat different. It's basically about the uh, joint venture approach and then basically using the brand name, using the uh, uh, others' uh, uh, technology as, as, uh, as development. Uh, and also we have more examples like that, like the recent example of GE purchases of Volvo, beating all the purchases of SAPs and things like that. It's all happening uh, with the JV approach. Now, the fourth model I classify as, as a Huawei model, uh, uh, which is basically from rural to urban, uh, using the Chinese city in Long Chun Huawei, which is basically. Uh, uh, Huawei has been a technology leader in its field and has actually over 70% of its revenue coming from international. And this is a very successful Chinese company. And uh, it is the only Chinese company that <coughs> coming into the 4,500 companies, the world market, uh, world, uh, market uh, competition. And uh, so it actually started with, the, in China, it started with rural and small cities, and then even big cities. And internationally, it started with uh, uh, developing countries, and then gradually with Europe and North America and other developed markets. So Huawei was actually quite successful, and for example, by, by this, uh, this year, 2001, we have a significant growth uh, overseas market with the net profit rise to 3.64 billion US dollars, uh, just for, for the recent figure. And other companies like Huawei, like Z, ZTZ, has adopted a similar strategy as, as Huawei, uh, this going global model. The fifth model I would like to clarify is a single model. The reason I call it the single model because in, in 2005 we had a very big purchase of a unicorn in the US, which wasn't 
very successful, but that actually represents uh, China's state-owned enterprises going global, acquire a large number of uh, you know, natural resources or, 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 or energy-related uh, uh, commodities and base. So, so this actually, this model has been really, uh, I, I see it on the rising side, particularly with the relevance with Australia, that uh, China has a lot, a lot, many companies actually, uh, state-owned enterprises, making acquisitions and uh, on the natural resources. And this probably will continue as China becomes the number two uh, economy in the world. And uh, of course, not only Silo, but other players like uh, China National Petroleum Corporation, China Petroleum Chemical Corporation, and China Green Metals, and many others. So this is a, this model actually is vital to, to China's uh, future energy and natural resource security. It's not only the major focus of uh, a future China uh, Overseas uh, direct investment, but also it is also one that potentially has many conflicts ahead down the road, and, uh, and how to handle this model properly, uh, properly and through constructive and cooperative approaches is really worth uh, further research. Now, the, the sixth model I call it the CIC model, uh, uh, China Investment Corporation, which is for the future of that. And basically, what they adopt is a strategy equity participation. And in recent years, with China foreign exchange reserve uh, reached the three trillion uh, US dollars, China started to invest overseas on some of the world ranking names, uh, firms. And uh, China has established China investment corporation to manage some of that uh, China overseas uh, investment equities. And that's really uh, become a, there's many other uh, Chinese companies doing that as well. They usually take a small equity uh, stake, uh, five to ten percent, and then and, and remain a passive investor. Uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the company uh, to avoid political uh, hassles in the overseas market. The sovereign funds, uh, as we know, that sometimes can raise a lot of eyeballs by the big investment. Uh, so, for example, we bought the third real estate in Blackstone and, and also 10% uh, in Morgan Stanley and a few others. Of course, uh, there's many other companies doing that as well, like SAFE, both uh, uh, foreign companies, and ICPC investment in the uh, a South Africa bank. And, and so this practice, I, I, I believe, will continue and will increase a China increase foreign exchange uh, uh, for portfolios. Now, the seventh model is project undertaking model. China has really sent a lot of uh, companies overseas to undertaking projects, sometimes with its own financing and project financing out of China. And uh, we see a lot of them, particularly in the Middle East and, and South Asia countries. Uh, of course, China also had a lot of risk on that. For example, the recent uh, uh, recent uh, losses in Libya, where China pulled out, and according to the news of finance, uh, China has lost 50 major contracts in Libya, and resulting of 18 billion US dollars. So this is actually uh, has some risk, but the China has traditionally doing this for a long time. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I was working in the Ministry of Commerce uh, uh, 20 years ago, was uh, uh, they had a quite a bit heavily involved in, in this aspect of the business of China taking contract overseas. Now, the number eight model, which I call it the Wenzhou model, uh, which is China's private enterprises going overseas. I see this model has a lot of potential and uh, uh, because uh, this is very unique and I have a lot of many uh, individual uh, small firms from Wenzhou uh, represented in the Zhejiang province, but actually it applies to many uh, small and medium enterprises in China and many other regions. As a matter of fact, according to a, a survey done by Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, uh, which I'm also a, a senior fellow there, a small and medium enterprise going global will be a major trend in the future. And the Chinese uh, respondent company with the investment into in Canada, over 50% are small enterprises, and 86% uh, are non SOEs. So this is actually a, a growing trend. I think it has also implications for Australia and and other developed countries. For example, Wenzhou, according to a, a study, uh, uh, one of my colleagues and I found a few years back, we found that uh, the Wenzhou destination, uh, which of the migration, uh, highly concentrated in Europe, uh, like uh, you know, mostly in Italy, in France, and Holland, and Spain. So, so this actually is continuing, and this momentum uh, will will be uh, in the future. To now, the ninth model is the uh, R&D model, and uh, believe it or not, China is actually Sending, uh, set up a lot of R&D centers overseas. Uh, for example, Huawei has set up 17 R&D centers overseas, and, and, and other companies uh, 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 do the same. Uh, uh, and also, we see uh, uh, a lot of Chinese companies are doing that. And uh, uh, 
for example, the Johnson province has actually set up 24 R&D centers uh, of, of overseas with its Johnson companies. So this probably is a good way to utilize the talents overseas and also cut down the cost uh, close to the, uh, to, the, to the market that Chinese companies serve. Now, the, the final model which I'm going to talk about is the Seagull model, and, uh, which means that uh, it's a free circulation approach. Uh, represents a lot of uh, returnees, overseas Chinese, uh, back and forth that the Chinese investors receive, and also some of the technical uh, industrial parts that China set up overseas. And those actually become very interesting because a lot of uh, returnees return back to China, set up high tech industry, internet, uh, biotech, and all, all the rest. And then actually, those companies come again, invest in the US, for example, in the US, uh, in New York, and NASDAQ, over 200 companies are listed there, mainly primarily through uh, this green circulation uh, uh, signal approach. Now, final thought, I think that uh, the, the Huawei uh, model will probably be more adopted in the future as, as China has more capital and also uh, will uh, uh, encounter more labor, expensive labor costs at home to, to really to drive this uh, approach and to also to reduce trade barriers. And also, it's not easy to make the novel model uh, uh, happen because uh, look at what happened in, in the novel is that uh, after it's purchased, the international market share has shrinked. And, uh, and actually it's getting out of Fortune 500 company. And uh, so, so because of the human resource challenges and also because of the uh, cultural uh, 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 communications. The farm model, I think, has a great potential because it has already shown the uh, technology uh, uh, success among the Chinese firms. And then that probably will continue to be more competitive in the future. The secret model is probably more challenging uh, one and a half because uh, China is in the big demand for natural resources and energy also feel the speed of growth, but uh, uh, it's supposed to be encounter more resistance from other big players uh, already in the market. And this model has to find a way to seek compromise with multinationals and also to cooperate more with developing countries. The CIC model we like to be more implemented because this is probably more suitable to Chinese, uh, which the passive uh, stakeholders and the minority holders and then uh, uh, pull, uh, you know, uh, uh, strive with the with companies together. The winter model is probably the most promising one. I think this one will, will have a lot of rules to develop in the future because uh, as more and more SME and company has come out of China, and this probably will be the wave of the uh, future investment in the overseas. And the future we will in big entrepreneurs also will be a, a new uh, wave of investment. And this is the uh, uh, state of values and the transaction and the circulation among them. So that, I, think, so I think that's probably what I discussing today because I think uh, a Chinese overseas investment strategy is quite different from a uh, traditional multinational approach. And I think that it's really worth further study and further uh, research on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you to the organizers of the conference for bringing me all the way here from Washington. Yeah. Any other Americans in the room? <laughs> Gosh. We have a lot of responsibility to you about here. All right, so my presentation takes us up outside of, of um, down under um, to Africa, and I'm looking at Chinese development aid in Africa. This is based uh, in part on, on a book I published a couple of years ago, The Dragon's Gift, the real story of China and Africa, but also on uh, current research that I'm doing and trying to see whether China is going to be a, or is already, a rule breaker, a rule taker, a rule maker in global development finance. So this presentation is uh, Chinese development aid in Africa, what, where, why, and how much. And I'm going to start off with a story that I told yesterday. So if you were listening to me yesterday, I apologize for the repetition. And don't tell what the, <laughs> what the uh, punchline is. OK. So once upon a time, there was a large, uh, very poor, uh, but resource-rich country just emerging from a period of intense conflict. And they decided to focus on development. We need to modernize our infrastructure, they said. We need to develop our ports and develop our energy and our power. And soon they had a, a visit from a wealthy Asian country that had already become a major consumer of their oil. And this Asian country said to them, we'll make you a bargain. We'll give you a line of credit worth $10 million. And you can <coughs> use this credit to import our technologies. Our companies can help you with your power plants and your ports. And many of us poor country were very concerned about this offer. It was quite controversial. But nonetheless, they eventually agreed to it, and the work began. Now, 
Does anyone know which two countries I'm talking about? I know some of you know. <laughs> One of them? As some people are saying China, you're right. One of the countries was China. And the other country was Japan. And the time was more than 30 years ago when China was just emerging from the Cultural Revolution. And when Deng Xiaoping first proposed this and started to discuss it, Mao Zedong was still in power. So you can imagine how controversial this was. Uh, but there are two things that I want to pull out of this story that relate to China's Asian Africa. And the first is that this deal was not aid. It wasn't official development assistance. It was on market terms. It was a commercial deal. And it was attractive to China because China, at that point, was not creditworthy. They couldn't borrow internationally. So they had to come up with some other way to do it. So it was a long-term <laughs> trade agreement that helped finance uh, imports from Japan. Um, but the second thing about this was that both Japan and China saw this as something of mutual benefit. They each saw it, but they had something to gain out of it. And these are some of the deals that China is setting up in Africa. Now, the very large ones that we hear about are structured on similar lines. Uh, but these do not qualify as foreign aid or official development assistance. Now, let me go into this in a little bit more detail. What, one of the questions is, what is foreign aid? Well, if we're looking at development aid uh, and we're trying to compare what China does with the rest of the world, we have to get our terms down. And so the terms that are used, I am pulling out of the OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, they are a group that has set the global rules global in, in as much as uh, they're the ones most of the donors follow, and the names, the norms for development assistance. So official development assistance, or ODA, has very specific criteria. It has to be concessional uh, to a certain degree. Um, it has to be given uh, with concessional intent. So it has to be something that a government actually subsidizes, <coughs> uh, it has to put actual budgetary resources into. And then everything else that comes from governments <coughs> comes under other official finance, or OOF. I love that term. So that'd be non-concessional loan export credits, which are credits that come primarily to support exports from your country. You can't count those as official development assistance, even if they're concessional. Uh, investment loans, guarantees, etc. So here's a picture of global development finance. And so we can see all of these different flows under here uh, coming out of various countries, including China, uh, private and official. And within official, the only things that count as uh, official development assistance are grants and concessional loans over there. So all these other things coming out of the official flows don't count as official development assistance or aid. And most of what China's doing is in those other categories. So it's poof. So China's developmental state abroad. China operates um, not the same as Japan, and we've heard about that with uh, regard to China's foreign investment, but in a similar manner, in that uh, they have many instruments to promote their interests, uh, many more than we're normally uh, used to in Western countries, where we have far fewer state-directed instruments. And that's particularly the case in the United States, where we tend to uh, not support our companies with direct uh, financial interventions from the government. So China, uh, their instruments that would count as aid are the blue ones, zero-interest loans and grants, and concessional loans, uh, and these are the Yohoi Dai Huan. These are mainly official development assistance. Everything else that comes out of the various um, government, the policy banks and, and the um, China's uh, Ministry of Commerce doesn't qualify uh, as official development assistance. And this would include preferential export credits, uh, mixed credits, uh, the development bank loans coming from China Development Bank, and all of these natural resource-backed loans that are done on commercial terms. So where does China actually give its official development assistance? What this is, is a chart that I put together out of a database that I have, that I actually started collecting in the 1980s of Chinese development aid in Africa. So if we're looking just at Africa, this um, chart shows us several interesting things. Down on one side, we've got all of the uh, these are all of the countries in Sub-Saharan Africa ranked according to the year in which they formed diplomatic ties with Beijing. And so you can see the uh, pink squares are years in which they had diplomatic ties, the white squares are years in which they did not. 
And so most of those I had ties with Taiwan during that period. And so across the top is from 1960 to 2007. And so what we can see here is these are the countries that are getting aid. Uh, the black squares and circles are aid agreements. And the database is not complete. Uh, it's all from open sources. But uh, from about 1983 onward, the sources are much better. And so the data is much better from that period onward. But you can see that there are a lot of years in which the Chinese are giving aid to a lot of countries. Um, and that it spread very broadly across the continent. And the main criteria is whether or not you have diplomatic ties, not whether or not you have natural resources. And the quantity of aid also uh, follows those patterns. Um, if you look here, these are the, the resource-rich countries are the ones shaded, um, and the ones that aren't resource-rich are the ones that are left blank. And this is, again, just South Saharan Africa. And then the uh, circles and squares, again, are aid agreements. So these are just in two years, 2006 and 2007. So we can see the pattern of aid is, is going all over to the countries, again, that uh, have diplomatic ties, um, not just to <coughs> research rich countries by any means. So why is China give aid? Well, the drivers are three. Um, the first is uh, strategic diplomacy. And the most important factor there is the one China policy. So aid is part of China's soft power portfolio, and they use it in competition with Taiwan. And Africa, with its many countries and many small countries, is one of the key places for this competition. The South Pacific is another area that's been important. And the Caribbean, with lots and lots of little countries in which this competition can play out without too much money being put up. So this is right now in hiatus. We have a, a pause in this competition, uh, with the government in Taiwan being a, uh, more friendly, um, uh, more able to accept this idea of, of there being just one China, and they just disagree about which one it is supposed to be. Um, but the second uh, motivator is, is business. And so we can see um, the aid, uh, particularly the concessional loans, are much, uh, they're very much about driving business and as an entry point for Chinese companies, particularly construction companies, but also Huawei that we just heard about, and Zhongxin Telecommunications, ZTE. Uh, they have been um, fostered, their business has been fostered by concessional loans coming out of China Exit Bank. And these do qualify as official developments. And so uh, the third area is uh, China's uh, wish to portray itself as a peaceful riser, as a responsible stakeholder um, and player in the global economy. And so things like aid, um, aid has started to, the rhetoric for aid has started to be um, phrased much more along the lines of uh, like the Millennium Development Goals and the uh, doubling of aid and the other things that the West has been saying about its aid. China's been starting to uh, adopt some of the same rhetoric, but peacekeeping forces and other forms of cooperation. So these are the drivers of aid. Um, and I've given uh, outline those there. So um, again, showing how important it is to have this widespread um, <coughs> engagement. These are This is a picture of Chinese leaders' visits to Africa. And these are only at the premier or the presidential level since 1995. And all of the countries in gray are countries that have been visited by a premier or a president. Um, and so you can see it's, it's pretty much across the board. They're going everywhere. And again, it's, um, it's not just the countries that are strategic in terms of natural resources. So going global, this is the business uh, aspect. And then here is a little more evidence on this construction interest. And you can see that um, Chinese companies' revenues from engineering projects have grown enormously. Uh, from 2002, you had 1.2 billion was the turnover that was reported to the Ministry of Commerce. Um, and by 2009, the turnover from Chinese engineering uh, companies in Africa was 28 billion. So that's an enormous increase. And these are not being financed predominantly by Chinese aid. These are being financed by a huge a variety of sources. The World Bank, the African Development Bank, uh, African governments that have resources. For example, Nigeria has, uh, and I put this out in, in my paper in the book, uh, a number of Chinese companies have won uh, an enormous number of contracts in Nigeria. And these are all financed by, by and large by the Nigerian government. So how much aid does China give? Well, in terms of official development assistance, it's quite small. These are figures uh, that I've estimated from 2008, and they fit in quite well with the uh, various um, uh, announcements that have come out from time to time from the Chinese government, and most recently, the official aid report in April 2011. These are disbursement figures. And in 2008, I estimated about $1.2 billion, which is quite small compared to 
Uh, even uh, Japan, 1.6 billion, or Germany, 2.7, and so on, and quite a bit smaller than the US. So what about these other loans that I talked about in the beginning? Why are these not considered official development assistance? They're widely called aid. For example, uh, China at this point has had almost uh, $14.5 billion uh, in Angola, uh, in these resource-backed loans. Uh, but what these are are market rate lines of export buyer's credits. They are tied to Chinese goods and services. It's along this Japanese model, and it's not concessional. And these are the terms um, of the ones in Angola. You can see China Exim Bank, $2 billion for the first tranche of this uh, long line of credit. It was at London Interbank Offer Rate, or LIBOR, plus 1.5%, uh, with a 12-year maturity. And the grace period, they didn't start paying back until the end of each project with a finance under the line of credit. But there was a Western Group Standard Chartered Consortium. They gave that very same year $2.35 billion to Angola. Also oil-backed. Both of these were oil-backed. Um, but the interest rate was 100 basis points different, or one percentage point. Uh, and the maturity was lower. So in, in other words, the Chinese loan was a better deal, uh, but it wasn't a good enough deal to be considered official development system. And the Chinese loan was tied to all of these projects. So this is why people think it's foreign aid, because it's financing development projects. But it's doing it through a different kind of instrument. And this is something we need to understand better about how China engages overseas. Now, uh, if you are interested in understanding more, I have a book about this, and I have a blog. Uh, so I welcome you to come and visit the blog and uh, see some of the other uh, updates of the book. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm uh, very happy to be here today. I'm also uh, well aware of my status as the last presenter before lunch uh, today, which is a very important status to have. Uh, so I'll, I'll keep this as short and sweet as I possibly can. Uh, my chapter for the update is about uh, China's approach to energy security, uh, and in particular, its approach uh, to what I call China's petroleum predicament, uh, or its uh, increasing dependence on imports to meet its oil demand. Uh, the chapter and, uh, and this presentation uh, are divided into uh, three parts. Uh, the, first, uh, the, the first part, I outline the uh, dimensions of China's uh, increasing uh, oil imports uh, and how that uh, uh, dependence on imports is growing over time. Uh, in the second part, I talk about uh, what I call China's struggle for oil security and the specific measures uh, that China is taking on the supply side to uh, ensure its access to oil uh, and imported oil supplies uh, in the future. Uh, and as you'll see from this presentation, uh, I, I basically argue that uh, I emphasize the limitations uh, of what China has been doing thus far uh, and, and, uh, and how it need, really needs to be uh, rethinking its approach a bit in the future. <clears throat> and then lastly, uh, I lay out what I think China really needs to do more of, and that is to take a more multilateral approach and engage with other uh, uh, major oil importers to a greater degree than it has uh, thus far. So very briefly, if you look at China's um, sort of, uh, oil import profile over the next couple of decades, uh, it's clear that China's going to be relying on imports more and more uh, in the future. Its uh, domestic production is uh, projected to decline <clears throat> over the next 25 years, uh, and its uh, overall demand uh, should increase substantially, resulting in a uh, fairly, fairly massive increase uh, in net imports. Uh, in uh, 2009, it imported about 53% of its uh, oil requirement. Uh, in 2035, the International Energy Agency projects that China will be uh, importing about 84% uh, of its oil supplies. So that's a substantial increase. Uh, and I should emphasize here that China has fairly significant demand side policies in place in order to limit the growth uh, of its oil demand. Uh, but even with these demand side policies uh, in place, it's likely that China's uh, dependence on imports is likely to increase in the future. So very, um, not surprisingly, China's taking a variety of different measures in order to uh, ensure that its oil supplies and its imported oil supplies in the future are adequate, reliable, uh, and affordable. Uh, and I want to focus on four different types of measures in the, uh, in the chapter, and I just want to briefly uh, go over each one of them here in, in the presentation. Uh, first, uh, China has been uh, helping its national oil companies, or NOx, uh, as they're called, uh, 
to go out and invest uh, overseas. And we've already been talking about that uh, a bit in some of the earlier uh, presentations here. Um, uh, next, it's been diversifying its suppliers and its uh, supply routes. Uh, it's also uh, taking efforts to uh, protect its uh, supply lines, and particularly the sea lines of communication through which its oil shipments flow. Uh, and lastly, it's building a, a strategic petroleum reserve. <coughs> so um, since the late 1990s, China has been helping its uh, the Knox to invest uh, overseas and encouraging them uh, to do so. Uh, in fact, the Knox themselves were quite eager to do that, and had already begun uh, to do so. They really didn't need uh, any encouragement. Um, and as a result of the uh, overseas investments that we've seen over the past decade, uh, the Knox now have operations in 31 foreign countries. Uh, we produce oil in 20 different countries around the world. Uh, and the, uh, but uh, most of that production is concentrated uh, in just four countries, uh, Kazakhstan, Venezuela, Angola, and Sudan. Uh, and this has been good. This has been good for the Knox. Um, it has helped them to increase their uh, reserve holdings uh, at a time when domestic production, the prospects of domestic uh, production in China are not bright, uh, and increase their sales uh, and profits. Uh, but the question remains whether this has been good for China, and whether it's been good for China's energy security. Uh, for some time, there's been a belief in China that oil produced by Chinese companies abroad is a more secure source of supply for China than that produced uh, by foreign companies. Um, I think this is a questionable belief, uh, and uh, this is uh, the behavior of the oil companies themselves in the past few years, and the independence that they've shown in Beijing, uh, and really underlined the point that, uh, that China isn't really enhancing its energy security simply by encouraging its oil companies to go out uh, and invest overseas. Um, and in fact, this behavior, some of this behavior that I described uh, in more detail in the chapter, now, has actually raised questions in Beijing as to whether this is an effective strategy for promoting Chinese energy security. Uh, so this, this sort of first tactic, uh, I don't think has really meaningfully enhanced China's energy security. If you look at China's efforts to diversify its sources of supply and its supply routes, uh, China has made some important progress uh, in this regard. Uh, in, the mid in the mid 1990s, uh, China was relying on uh, just two regions of the world for about 90% uh, of its oil imports, uh, the Persian Gulf and, and Asia. Uh, and within Asia, most of the oil is coming from Indonesia. Uh, over the next 10 years, uh, China's uh, imports increased dramatically, uh, but it has also succeeded in uh, diversifying uh, its imports and starting to import oil um, from Russia and the Americas, and uh, most importantly, as you can see here, from Africa uh, as well. But over the past five years, uh, this diversification has really plateaued. Uh, and it looks like China's going to be relying quite heavily uh, on the Persian Gulf in Africa uh, for its oil imports. In the future, and that means that it's going to be depending on supply lines running through the Indian Ocean uh, and the Malacca Strait. Um, and this is likely to be the case, uh, notwithstanding some of the loans for oil deals that we've been seeing uh, in recent years uh, from China during the uh, financial crisis. Uh, I won't go into the details here for reasons of time, uh, but if you look at if you look at the chapter, uh, it's quite clear that uh, uh, the suppliers like Russia are not going to be supplanting uh, the Persian Gulf and Saudi Arabia uh, as China's primary oil supplier uh, anytime soon. So uh, again, this is this is a tactic that uh, uh, China has had some success with, but there's still um, I, I think uh, real limitations with further diversifying its sources. Uh, if you look at efforts to um, protect supply lines, um, obviously China's uh, naval modernization has been getting a lot of attention, especially with the development uh, of its first aircraft carrier uh, under, uh, getting underway this year, uh, and also an uh, interest in uh, building uh, domestically uh, constructed aircraft carrier, which um, reportedly is, has just recently gotten underway. Uh, there's also a lot of discussion within China about the kind of overseas a support network that would, that would need to maintain the blue water navy uh, in places like uh, the Indian Ocean. I think the, the main question for uh, questions of, of energy security and, and oil security in 
particular is the kinds of missions that this sort of emerging uh, nascent uh, Chinese uh, Blue Water Navy is going to undertake. Uh, and will it emphasize more multinational uh, cooperative efforts uh, like we're seeing in the uh, uh, off the coast of Eastern Africa, uh, the anti piracy missions that China has been contributing to uh, for the past couple of years? Uh, or will it tend to emphasize more unilateral missions? which are designed to enforce China's territorial claims in the uh, East and South China Seas. Uh, I think a more, more clarity from China uh, on this point would be helpful and, uh, and would be uh, reassuring to the international community. Uh, lastly, if you look at China's strategic uh, petroleum reserve, uh, this is uh, a very, very significant effort. And I think is it has a lot of potential to contribute to China's energy security uh, in the future. Uh, the first phase is already complete, uh, and the next two phases will be uh, complete by 2020. Uh, at that point, it is uh, currently projected that China's uh, reserve will be able to cover about 100 days uh, of net imports, which is, uh, <coughs> which is quite a substantial uh, reserve. And the question here is how will China manage uh, its reserve, and to what degree will it coordinate uh, with other countries that also have substantial reserves? And this brings me to my last point, and that is the, the need for greater multilateralism uh, in China's approach to energy security. Uh, traditionally, the, uh, the forum for coordinating uh, the actions of major uh, oil importers in response to a supply disruption has been the International Energy Agency. Uh, China is obviously not a member of the IEA uh, at present, although it has developed an increasingly close relationship uh, with, uh, with the over the past few years. Um, <clears throat> its continuing absence is increasingly problematic as China becomes uh, a bigger uh, oil importer uh, and, and it develops a very substantial uh, strategic petroleum reserve. Uh, and, and real fear within the IEA that it's going to become increasingly irrelevant uh, or at least weaken the agency in the future as China and other countries uh, uh, become uh, bigger and bigger players in the international oil market. Uh, in the chapter, uh, I lay out several different barriers to China actually becoming a formal member uh, of the organization. I think the most important of these uh, are China, China's own misgivings about what it would mean for China to be a member of the United uh, But I think all of these can and should be overcome uh, in the long run. Uh, and I think a, a positive precedent was set just recently when the IEA uh, announced that it's releasing, or that its members would be releasing uh, 60 million barrels on the international oil market. Uh, China was apparently consulted about the decision before it was made, and after it was announced, China publicly uh, said it supported and approved the decision. So I think that kind of consultation and coordination is something uh, we'd all like to see more of, and I think would be in China's interest and, uh, and the interest of other important countries as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks to the uh, three uh, speakers. Uh, we just had a uh, very interesting uh, presentation. As you can see, I'm not very good in managing my own time, but I'm very good at listening in the other. <laughs> um, we still have about 10 15 minutes left. Um, let's try to keep both questions and responses uh, really brief. Um, I would actually suggest, if, if it's okay with the speaker, that we collect three questions first, and then we'll ask uh, the speaker to respond. If we still have time, we'll go another round, otherwise we'll start again. So, who want to ask the first three questions? I can see there's one question at the back, there's one question here, and there's one question here. So, we already have three.
but I really enjoyed the talks. I have uh, two questions for uh, Professor Tonika. Uh, afternoon, two questions are from yesterday too. First of all, I wonder whether you are trying to express any message from the cover image of your book, uh, uh, the, the, especially the facial expression of the African <laughs> uh, And then the second question is, uh, I feel the misunderstanding about China in Africa is a bigger problem actually about the understanding of China in, in general. So I wonder, will you try to promote a more informed understanding of China in Africa? What kind of prospect and uh, challenges you face to spread more informed understanding? Uh, I suppose uh, if people have to speak China or Africa, they might be less informed. So what kind of uh, challenges or prospect and problems I would appreciate? Thank you. Okay, uh, do you want to respond? Is it fun? No. Um, the first question was about Libya. And um, I think I, I disagree that China's done a lot to support Gaddafi. They, uh, China's relations with Libya have actually not been very close. And uh, we were just talking about this yesterday, that uh, Libya, in fact, recognized Taiwan for quite a long time. So there hasn't been a long uh, period of, um, of positive relationships between the Chinese government and the, and the Libyan government under Gaddafi. So uh, what they have done is go after business there. And this $18 billion that you saw um, from the Ministry of Commerce in, uh, that looks like China's losses, these are actually the, the value of the lost contracts. Um, so they assigned contracts worth $18 billion in Libya. And that was, um, I think, around 2008, 2009. And the, this is, um, at that point, it was more than a third of the value of the contracts that the Chinese companies had signed in Africa for engineering projects were in Libya. So this is a, um, this is a, a huge uh, loss, but it's more, it's an opportunity cost as well, it, it, not really a direct loss per se, it's the, the loss, uh, the value of that business. So um, in terms of, it's related to the second question about non-interference, what role will, will the PLA take in Future. I think we're a long way from seeing a PLA that projects the way uh, the United States Army projects to project to protect American uh, interests abroad. Um, and we've seen very little uh, examples of, of actual intervention. There have been um, there's been one example in uh, off the coast of Somalia of Chinese the Chinese Navy um, to try to protect the trade routes there, along with other countries that are trying to do that as well. And then this rescue operation. And so I think it'll be a much more defensive uh, kind of thing, rescuing people, uh, protecting ships that are in international waters, than intervening uh, militarily or having military uh, protections for Chinese investments in Africa. I don't see that happening. I mean, that's a, a huge infringement <laughs> to actually send your military to that. I think the Chinese be sensitive about that. Um, and in terms of the cover image, um, I, I like that picture because I think there's a young African boy who's kind of, to me his expression says, show me, you know, show me what's going on. What is the real story? He's kind of skeptical. And he's standing in front of this uh, Chinese um, arch, which is actually, uh, it's a gambling uh, center in Zambia. Um, so it's a Chinese casino. And I understand that after that picture was taken, uh, that casino was sold to uh, an investor from South Africa or <laughs> some other place like that. So it may not even be owned by the Chinese anymore. I'm not sure if that's true. So um, I think the, the picture is out there as a, uh, I, I like the image and, and I proposed it to OUP, um, but it, it's a, a kind of a skeptical picture, but also um, the, the future for Africa is its young people. And they're the ones that need to see whether or not this relationship is going to turn out to be beneficial for them. Now, it, it, I'm, I am trying to promote a more informed understanding, and I've been doing that by accepting a lot of invitations like this <laughs> to come. And while I'm here, I'm speaking to people in the government and uh, to try to engage uh, on the basis of a uh, more in-depth understanding of how China works as a, as a big donor and as a, um, a global and a going global um, government. So that's what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm spending probably too much time. <laughs> that kind of thing, but uh, it's also, that it's, for me, it's something that um, I find just so fascinating. And there's so many things to look into, so many things to try to uh, 
dig into. And uh, that's why I have a blog, because I just have more and more to say on this all the time. There's so many uh, rumors out there to, to track down the reality of it. So. Yeah, I'll just speak anything that. <clears throat> Maybe I just want to add on the first question. I think that's precisely the, uh, the, the risk of chance not to go global, that's uh, what you refer to in Libya, because uh, uh, you see that China uh, uh, actively, uh, traditionally, very actively in Africa, Middle East, and Libya uh, represent a good example, so there's a lot of political risk uh, there that uh, if Chinese company all went there and, and uh, invest heavily or to undertake a project, uh, take too many forms, that if, if not uh, carefully, China could end up uh, uh, taking a lot of uh, heavy tolls that uh, uh, risk in, in, in taking part in those countries. So I think that precisely shows an example of that. Even though it's uh, many state-owned enterprises, but it has to be really uh, uh, followed with a business decision uh, rather than you know, going there uh, on the wrong thing. Thank you. Have any? I would just add that I think the Libya case really underscores the uncertainty within China as to how it should deal with situations like this. Uh, its behavior at the UN, I think, suggested a lot of uncertainty and, and unfamiliarity with this kind of issue, whether, whether or not it, it would be in China's interest to support the kind of uh, action that's, that's being uh, uh, taken. And, and if it's not, how, how do you, what else do you do? Um, I, I just think that China has a lot of thinking through to do about how uh, stability in uh, the Middle East Africa, and it's really at the beginning of that process, not the end. Okay, uh, anybody want to go for a second one? We have one question there, there, and there, about well, three. Uh, that's all. You're the first. Uh, ODA has been very limited because it's been small. Uh, so there hasn't 
been uh, a lot of impact. And just as with um, other countries, uh, foreign aid in Africa, there also we've seen very little impact, with perhaps the exception of health. Um, most recently, there has been, uh, in the HIV AIDS, I think you can see really significant impact and also tuberculosis. But other areas, uh, there's hope for malaria, but um, we haven't done well in agriculture, we haven't done well in infrastructure, governance, <laughs> a lot of problems uh, with things that we put money into. Um, but in terms of OOF, uh, in terms of uh, the finance that's going in, that's um, resource-backed loans, I think we're seeing a much more substantial impact on infrastructure. And this is an area of huge deficit uh, in Africa. And so the extent to which uh, Chinese finance can find creative ways of uh, paying for infrastructure investments with future resources. Um, I argue that this is an agency of restraint in countries with poor governance and suffering from the resource curse to actually tie future um, exports of the resource to pay for development expenditures today. It's an interesting model. So um, I think that uh, the media coverage in Africa domestically has been um, is next because uh, there is a very um, deep tradition of investigative journalism in Africa, in most countries, with some exceptions, particularly in South Africa, a little bit in Kenya and other places. So you don't find a lot of really well-informed reporting. And a lot of it tends to reflect uh, and reprint papers, uh, the stories that come out in northern newspapers, or some of the case of Australia, the Mississippi um, Morning Herald, and so on. That's a very good story, and some good reporting. So they do tend to, re to repeat that. There are exceptions uh, in Rwanda, in, in uh, Uganda, for example. He has a newspaper there, and he's done um, much more interesting work. And um, he's actually very positive about the Chinese uh, presence. And others uh, in Zimbabwe, there's very active debates going on in the papers, um, pro and con, uh, and so on. So there's a lot of variety there. Um, and it's quite interesting to follow. Then in terms of, or I guess I want to make one quick point about the UN and, and Libya. And I think uh, the Chinese role here is, is fascinating. We've heard some uh, points about that. But one thing is, is I think we're, we're at a sort of critical um, point where um, the coalition forces that have been um, pushing the, uh, the military engagements in Libya have I think pretty clearly gone beyond uh, what the original vote was in, in terms of the protection of the Libyan people. And this is important, and the Chinese have been uh, quite critical of this. And it's important because to uh, keep the uh, legitimacy of the UN and the Security Council as an institution, uh, it's important for all of its members to kind of keep within the, the boundaries of the agreements that have been made. And I think that in this case, that it's, um, it's the United States and France and, and the UK that are, are more responsible for um, uh, maybe violating the norms uh, for that kind of global institution, which is obviously economic. Thank you. Uh, I'll just respond uh, very briefly. Uh, I respond quickly to Jane's question, which I think is an excellent one. In terms of trying to figure out or who's in charge of some of these uh, SOEs, I, I was looking for instances where the interests of the party, the interests of the corporate interests of the, um, the oil company uh, diverged. Uh, and where they diverged, uh, how did the company behave? Uh, and if they behaved in, way, in ways that favored their own corporate interests, uh, did they get away with it? Uh, I'll give an example uh, of, uh, there are a number of examples of that. Uh, in recent years, but the example I'll give in the chapter is a few years ago when oil prices were uh, even higher than they are today. Um, uh, the Chinese uh, oil companies weren't able to pass on their rising costs to domestic consumers in China because the oil prices were regulated uh, by the state in order to mitigate the impact on, on inflation. Uh, what happened was the oil companies then reduced their refinery throughput uh, in China as a way of sort of protesting. Resulting in uh, fairly substantial shortages uh, in China a lot, uh, in terms of gas and whatnot. Um, and so it was clear that they, they acted in their own corporate interests rather than the national interest in making oil, oil available to the domestic market. Uh, and they got away with it. Um, uh, in, the, in recent years, the party has actually moved to liberalize uh, oil prices uh, within China. So it actually seems like they've been gotten their way on this one. And it's clear they're acting in their own corporate interests rather than the national one. Yeah, I just want to add a briefly to the second question. I think that uh, whether it's a party or it's a, a, a company uh, 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 exchange of officials and uh, 
which is, I think is uh, not being challenged characteristic, as we all know that uh, if the officials move to the uh, uh, companies, uh, or company officials move to the government, that may help uh, Chinese actually the, the, the government run the business. And uh, as a matter of fact, China these days, if you look at 31 governments, it's like a 31 uh, CEO, also of a large corporation, and got hundreds of municipalities, uh, hundreds of small CEOs. So they compete amongst each other. So, so that's where it made in China uh, very different. But I think it, it, it has to be in the future set clear lines for business and government is totally different. But, but right now it's China's situation. Thank you. Um, when I advised uh, one of my PhD students to uh, choose this area for study, I said that this is a new area, this, these issues will be with us for a very long time. So for young people, it's a good idea to choose an area for specialization. Um, I actually think it's the, it's the same for the student and it's the same for us. Um, as I mentioned, that we're all working very hard on the Peter Drysdale's leadership um, project, and this will spend more time, and many other people working on these issues, more and more people working on uh, these issues uh, now. Um, but I, I think, and I hope you all agree with me, that uh, we all benefit from this uh, discussion during uh, this session. Um, and so before you uh, race to your lunch, can I ask you to join me uh, in thanking the three 